Generation 3 added a lot to the Pokemon series. Beautifly. Shroomish. Rico. Gladius. But above and beyond, the most exciting addition was double battles. Now, instead of a 1v1 slugfest where the Pokemon with the better stats or moveset would almost always win out, the focus could be on strategy, synergy between your team members that could guarantee that not just the strongest Pokemon, but the strongest unit would win out. This was not only incredibly important for the burgeoning competitive scene, but it also turned what would normally be simple battles on your way to the Elite Four into fun, tactics-focused bouts of skill and strength. Enter Tate and Liza. They're twins. Or at least that's what they tell you. I actually believe that they're two split pieces of a psionic superconsciousness that was erroneously created while experimenting with Deoxys, but that's a topic for another video. For our purposes today, they're the leaders of the Moss Deep City Gym, and if you were looking for a difficult double battle in Hoenn, this was it. Not only did they use one of the strongest types in the entire series, but their team was actually well put together, meaning most challengers would have to put a little thought into their team composition if they wanted to make it through this fight. But how strong are they really? This is a question I wanted to answer, which is why they're going to be the next challenge in our BQ series. Today, we'll put them to the test and try to solo them with every single Pokemon in the Hoenn Regional Pokedex in an attempt to see just how strong they really are. This is the fifth entry in my BQ ranking series and follows our last challenge against Gym Leader Whitney. So, how do Hoenn's terrible twins stack up against the competition? Let's find out. But first, we'll need to take a quick look at the rules. The main goal of this challenge is to fight Tate and Liza with every Pokemon in the Hoenn Regional Pokedex one by one, and once we're done, we'll compare the number of Pokemon that could solo them with the total number of Pokemon used to get our Bruno Quotient, a rough measure of their strength or weakness as trainers. Of course, with this being a double battle, I had to make some small alterations to the rules to accommodate that. Usually, we go against our opponents with a single Pokemon and see how they can do. But because the double battle is forced for this gym challenge, this time around we'll be going in with two Pokemon of the same species, just to keep things fair. Also, based on our team size relative to theirs and the level of their ace, we'll be tackling this challenge with a 1.1 times level modifier on all of our Pokemon, meaning they each have to beat Tate and Liza while at level 46, or die trying. As for what we can do to our Pokemon to accomplish this, here are our restrictions. For the first round of 20 attempts, I'll try to beat the fight with our Pokemon maxed out in a way that's realistic to this point in the game, meaning we'll be limited to movesets and held items that would be possible in a normal playthrough. Given that this fight is a double battle, this also means that if we only have one TM available and we put it on one of our Pokemon, its teammate will have to find a different option to fill out its moveset. I also want to note that for powerful moves like Ice Beam, Thunderbolt, and Flamethrower, which can technically be purchased at the game corner an infinite number of times, I've limited myself to one use per Pokemon team, just to make things more interesting. Beyond that, our EVs and IVs can be maxed out, items other than held items are completely banned, and we won't be allowing the use of Attract, Double Team, One-Hit KO moves, moves that alter accuracy, or Hidden Power. After 20 attempts with these restrictions, if we're able to get a victory with a certain Pokemon, we'll give ourselves one point toward our final score. However, if a Pokemon isn't able to get it done in the first round, we'll move on to round two, taking the weights off, unlocking their potential, and allowing the use of any TMs and held items that could theoretically be used by the Pokemon. For any Pokemon that win in this round, they'll earn half a point. And those are the rules, which means it's about time to take the twins on and see what they can really do. Same as always, I'll take this type by type, so let's kick off round one with water. Tate and Liza seem to have taken a page out of Blaine's book, because despite living on an island surrounded by water types, the majority of their team is weak to them. Add on to this that almost every single water type Pokemon can learn Surf, which hits both opponents in a double battle at the same time, and the fact that we can teach both of our Pokemon the move, and this fight wasn't all that difficult for the majority of the Pokemon in this type. Using a combination of Rain Dance, Surf, Ice Beam, and occasionally Hydro Pump, we picked up easy victories with the Mudkip, Wingle, Goldeen, Tentacool, Carvana, Whalmer, Barboach, Corphish, Staryu, Psyduck, Clampearl, Chincho, and Horsey Lines. This set of moves was also enough to see Lombre and Ludicolo, Gyarados, Meryl and Azumarill, Milotic, Relicanth, Corsola, 
Love Disc, and finally Kyogre to quick victories. The three water types that had trouble were Little Guys Lotad, Magikarp, and Feebas. While Magikarp was an understandable loss in round 1, Lotad and Feebas both seemed to me like they could possibly get the win, given their varied movesets and, in Lotad's case, access to HP stealing moves like Giga Drain and Mega Drain. However, with their weak defenses and some bad luck, these never panned out, and we were forced to put them in line for round 2, ending round 1 water with 39 out of 202 victories. As for the grass type, this was another one that I had high hopes for. While they don't have a universal move like Surf that can hit both of their opponents at once, they still have a strong matchup against their rock and ground type team members, which I was hoping would carry us to victory. However, our opponents do have an answer to this type. Zatu, while it doesn't have a flying type move, still resists grass type damage, making it the most immediate concern in our quest for victory. Surprisingly, I still generally ended up using grass type moves to take this Pokemon out, and this was because of one move in particular, Sunny Day. This is a move that's going to show up a lot in this battle, because not only does it appear on both their Zatu and Solrock to buff up the latter's flamethrower, but it's also a move that an incredible amount of Pokemon can learn via TM. And on top of that, Sunny Day takes this already powerful move and makes it even stronger by removing its charging turn. So it was pretty much a no-brainer to run it on nearly any Pokemon that could learn it by leveling up. Combining the Sunny Day Solar Beam combo with moves such as Toxic, Protect, Giga Drain, Leech Seed, and Sleep Powder, we were able to secure victories with the Trico and Shroomish lines, as well as with Roselia and Tropius without an issue. Cacneo was also able to pick up a victory for its evolutionary line, although in this case I had to use Return on the first Cacnea while following it up with a growth boosted Giga Drain from the other to eke out a win. As for the Seedot and Oddish lines, things got a little more difficult. Seedot isn't particularly strong, and though I tried a combination of the super effective Shadow Ball mixed with Growth and Solar Beam, we quickly reached 20 attempts without seeing the win, and were forced to upgrade to its stronger brother Nuzleaf to knock out their enemies and get a win for itself and Shiftry. And Oddish also had a really tough time with this one. With their low speed, the moment I sent them out one of them would faint to Psychic, leaving the other to wait in terror until it too was picked off. This meant that we had to get lucky with the AI and wait for a round where the Zatu used Calm Mind to even give us a chance of putting either of them to sleep, and infuriatingly I kept missing on at least one of them and ended up with a failure on this Pokemon. But just by switching to Gloom, I was able to get a victory for the rest of this evolutionary line and finish up round 1 grass at 53 out of 202. Next up is Fire, which was a type that I was particularly worried about because both Solrock and Lunatone are resistant to it, but it turned out not to be anywhere near as difficult as I expected. Most of the Pokemon here can learn Flamethrower, and since their two leads took normal damage to this move, I was generally able to deal with them without issue. Although the following Solrock and Lunatone were a bit annoying, Solrock turned out to be a real homie and almost always set up a sunny day turn, giving us a boost in power that helped us make it over the line most of the time, especially when combined with utility moves such as Toxic and Swagger. Thanks to this combo, we picked up wins with the Nummel and Vulpix lines, as well as with Combusken and Blaziken. Torkoal also got the win, but it took what may have been some of the best luck I've ever had in one of these fights to do it, with a crit on Overheat taking out the Claydol, and subsequent Amnesia turns allowing them to survive just long enough for some of the craziest clutching I've ever seen. And seriously, I'm just gonna let this one play for a second so that you can see for yourself. Hell yeah, Torkoal. The only Pokemon here who still struggled with Tate and Liza's team were the Slugma line, who were just too slow to get through Claydol's Earthquake, and Torchic who, even with Swagger, just didn't have luck on their side. With those three relegated to round 2, we finish off round 1 fire with 60 out of 202 victories. Next up is the Flying type, which was hard not so much because of their weakness to Rock, but more so because of their lack of a good move set against Tatemalize's team. Still, I was actually able to get victories with almost everyone here, even if it required me to turn into a child pageant mom and focus all of my energy on teaching Swablu to sing while neglecting my oldest son Doduo until he had developed a hard enough exterior to learn steel with. But hey, you can't argue with results, and I was able to get a win with both of these lines just fine, even if Josh almost died in the process. Taylo, unsurprisingly, had the most trouble here. Although it had Steel Wing and Guts, the limitation of having just a single TM was too much to overcome, and we ended up having to wait until round 2 to see how our little friend would fare, ending round 1 flying with 65 out of 202. Electric is next on the docket, and this one was, predictably, a bit of a toss-up. 
The Pokemon here are across the board pretty powerful, but they also suffer from a debilitating ground weakness that turns them into the perfect prey for Tatanalyze's Claydol to shred apart with Earthquake, and each member of this type had to find a way around that move. Thankfully, the majority of them were also fast enough to get a move off before this happened, and with a combination of Swagger to hold off the Claydol and other varied chicanery, we were able to get it done with a lot of them. For Electric and Manectric, Howl, Iron Tail, and Crunch presented enough variation to make it through their team, while Magnemite and Magneton preferred a combination of Thunder Wave, Metal Sound, Thunderbolt, and Return to get it done. Pikachu and Raichu didn't need much more than Iron Tail, Light Screen, and Thunderbolt to find their victory, and for Electrode, we were able to secure the fight in our favor. Unfortunately, Voltorb, Pichu, Plusle, and Minin presented far more of a challenge for us here. For Voltorb, although most of the pieces were there in its moveset, we just never got enough confusion turns to kill the Claydol, and Pichu, being weaker than its older siblings, also folded quickly to the power of Earthquake. Plusle and Minin, on the other hand, were two that I had high hopes for, given they were intentionally designed for double battles. Loading them up with moves like Helping Hand and Light Screen, I tried really hard to make it work with these two, but given we needed a crit Iron Tail to even have a chance of taking their Claydol out, it was a fool's errand. We quickly lost round 1 with Plusle not getting any crits, and then, as if to add insult to injury, we actually got the crit with Minen, only to find out that even that wasn't enough. With these two Pokemon out for the count, we finished off round 1 Electric with 72 out of 202 wins. I want to talk about the bug type next, if only to get it out of the way. This type is famously underpowered, but in this case it actually has the very clear benefit of being strong against Psychic, which should make it a bit more interesting. Now, before you get too excited, I am just going to tell you now that Wurmpole, Silcoon, and Cascoon did not stand a chance in round 1. They don't learn any bug type moves, and with multiple resistances to normal damage present on the enemy team, not even struggle is going to give us a chance here. So how about we just toss them over to round 2 right now and not waste any more time on them. As for the revolutions, however, things were a little bit more spicy. Beautifly, with its access to strong super effective moves like Silver Wind and Giga Drain, took care of their team without much of an issue. But Dustox, surprisingly, had a much worse time with it. Although it too could learn Silver Wind, it didn't seem as able to take advantage of it in this fight. And after 20 attempts, I was sadly forced to send Dustox over with its siblings into the round 2 box. Actually, so long as we're talking about failures in this type, let's just get the other two out of the way now. Ninkata, with its weird stats and reliance on Metal Claw for decent damage, was never really able to stand up to Tatanlyza's team, and Illumi suffered from a similar limitation to Dustox, never seeming able to take advantage of its decent moveset in any meaningful way. Both of these are going to have to wait for round 2, but we were at least able to get wins with the rest of the Pokemon in this type, using a combination of Hydro Pump and Ice Beam on Surskit and Masquerade, Shadow Ball and Silver Wind on Ninjask and Shedinja, Signal Beam and the Busted Tail Glow on Volbeat, and good old Strength and Brick Break on Heracross and Pinsir to finish off round 1 bug with a respectable 80 out of 202. Oh, whoa, what's that? You're telling me that next up is everybody's favorite type? That's right, ladies and gentlemen, we're looking at Grok next. I think that, compared to our standard Grok loadouts, this time around things were actually a lot more interesting. If only because Tatanalyze's team is incredibly resistant to rock and entirely resistant to ground. So rather than being able to look at broad trends, we're going to have to look at most of these lines one by one. Which is why, for the first time in this series' history, I'll be initiating the Grok Speed Round. Enjoy the ride, folks, because we won't be here for long. On Sancher and Sandslash, Sword Stance and Iron Tail were all we needed, while two big crunch crits from Vibrava, try saying that five times fast, earned itself and Flygon a victory over the enemy. Baltoy and Claydol relied on Solar Beam and Shadow Ball to get them into position to reveal a little explodey surprise, and Fampy shocked the world with its swagger, getting enough self-hits and pulling out a clutch last-minute survival to hit Iron Tail and bring the W home for itself and Donphan. Rhydon handled itself well with Rock Blast and Sword Stance, and Groudon was Groudon, two victories which led us over to the rock side of Grok Paradise. Here we showed Tate and Liza how it was done, running Shadow Ball on Lunatone and Soul Rock to knock them into the Shadow Realm. After which, we picked up wins with Lilip and Cradilly through Confuse Ray and Grass Damage, Armaldo with Metal Claw, Regirock with Ancient Power and Hyper Beam, and Graveler and Golem through a heart-stopping display where a combination of Swagger and Rock Blast allowed them to hold on just long enough to get off an explosion and take their two Rock-type enemies out with them. Whew. Okay, so there are the victories from the Grok-type, but of course there were a few Pokemon that just couldn't do it. 
For Geodude, although I had hoped to get them into explosion range as well, Claydol's Earthquake was an impassable barrier, and the same was true for Nosepass and Rhyhorn. Anorith got pretty close to a win with Swords Dance and Metal Claw, but with its inability to survive more than a hit from its enemies, this one also ended up being a no-go. Which leaves us only with Trap Inch, who, despite swaggering and crunching his little heart out, unfortunately had no chance but to wait for round 2 to prove himself. When all is said and done, we end Grok with 98 out of 202 victories, and move on to Poison. This type was one I was absolutely dreading, purely because the majority of Pokemon here are not only incredibly weak to Psychic and Ground, but also incredibly slow. Because of this, there were a good number of Pokemon who I just couldn't make work no matter how hard I tried, as the second they were sent out, the Claydol would just rip an Earthquake, followed up with a super effective Psychic from the Zatu to clean up any stragglers. Due to this difference in power level, the Pokemon Gulpin and Grimer were complete non-starters, and were easily pushed around too without much difficulty. As for Coughing and Zubat, our two other little guys in this type, they didn't fare much better. Although their ability to fly, or in Coughing's case, hover, did save them from an Earthquake adjacent death, both of Tate and Liza's starters still had Psychic, and being smart enough to use it, these two Pokemon joined their friends in the round 2 corner quickly enough. But for the rest of the members of the Poison type, I was pleasantly surprised by their ability to put up a fight. Golbat and Crobat, with their high speed and decent attack stats, were able to get off Confuse Rays and then chip away at their team with Shadow Ball and Giga Drain, while Swalot combined Amnesia to raise its special defense with strong moves such as Shadow Ball and Ice Beam to secure itself a victory. Koga's exploding extraordinaires, Muck and Weezing, relied on Swagger to bring them to a point where they could explode, and Seviper, probably the coolest member of this type, chomped down on the members of their team like Pop Rocks and brought us up to 104 out of 202 victories. To follow up from the Poison type, I think it would be appropriate to move on to fighting next. This type suffers from the same drawback of taking super effective damage to psychic type moves, but it also has the added difficulty of being a predominantly physically attacking type, and in a generation before the physical special split, this is a big deal. Because of this fact, the only Pokemon that had what we could call an easy time with this fight was Metatite, who has an equal special and physical attack stat, and easy access to the elemental punches. And even here, we required an incredible amount of luck to find a win within 20 attempts. After rolling lucky damage on the Claydol to take it out with two ice punches, I had to hit a double swagger on the two Calm Mind users to incapacitate them, and get lucky again when the Zatu took itself out with swagger damage, after which our first Metatite used its last sliver of health to set up a light screen that gave its partner the chance to stack Calm Minds, buff up its special attack, and finish the fight for its fallen comrade. And that was the easy one. The Makuhita and Machop lines, on the other hand, were pretty much straight out of luck, folding to Psychic and Earthquake damage without being able to make any headway on their own offensive. Out of these five Pokemon, only Machamp got the lucky break it needed to get a win, relying on Leer of all things to lower the opening duo's defense and take them out with return and strength, and then lower the Lunatone's defense just enough for them to take it out before it shredded us with Psychic. And even after this, the only reason we got the win at all with Machamp was because the AI decided to go with Sunny Day and Solar Beam over Psychic on the Soul Rock. But beggars can't be choosers, and with this lucky break, we were able to finish up round 1 fighting and bring our total to 107. After the struggle of poison and fighting, I think it's about time we take a breather and look at some of the powerful endgame types that didn't have such a hard time with this fight. For the Ghost type, Stab Shadow Ball held all of the answers to our prayers, and we picked up easy wins with Shuppet, Bayonet, Duskull, and Dusclops before moving on to the Dark type, where Poochyena, Mightyena, Sableye, and Absol were able to combine moves like Shadow Ball, Crunch, and Iron Tail to devastating effect, and take out Tate and Liza's entire team without much issue. Ice was also a breeze, with super effective moves like Ice Beam, Blizzard, and Surf carrying us to honor and glory with the Snow Runt and Sveal lines, and with my boy. As for Dragon, the fact that the weakest of these Pokemon is a pseudo legendary helped a lot, and we picked up wins via Crunch and Ice Beam with Shelgon, Salamence, Latias, Latios, and Rayquaza without issue. However, and a bit to my surprise, Bagon's best moves dealing special damage ended up hindering it enough that we weren't able to get the win within 20 attempts, and had to send the strongest of little guys over to round 2. With these four types finished, our total rises to 126 out of 202 victories. Next up, let's see how we did using Tate and Liza's own moves against them, and take a look at the Psychic type. Luckily for us, pretty much every Pokemon here is big brained as hell, and through a combination of strong special moves such as Thunderbolt, Ice Punch, Hypnosis, and even Solar Beam, we were able to get easy wins with the Abra, Spoink, and Natu lines, 
and also with Chimeco, Girafferig, and Deoxys. Ironically, the fact that Tate and Liza's team uses such powerful moves also made Why Not and Wobbuffet easy victories this time around, with Mirror Coat and Counter dealing massive damage in response to their uses of Psychic and Earthquake, which left us with only the Ralts line to finish this type off. Although Ralts is quite powerful relative to being a little guy, we still needed Hypnosis to hit if we wanted any chance at winning this fight, and I'm sorry to say that it just didn't happen. Hypnosis's accuracy in these games is infuriatingly low, and while I was able to get both of them asleep once in a while, the Claydol always woke up too soon and knocked both of the Ralts into round 2 before they knew what was coming to them. But for all of the bad luck that we had with Ralts, we seemed to have the opposite with Curlia, as we almost immediately got 5 rounds of sleep on the Zatu, which allowed us to focus the other Pokemon on their team before finally taking the bird out with Thunderbolt and bringing our score up to 140 out of 202. The Steel type is up next, and being honest, there's not too much to say about this one. This type both resists Psychic and is strong against most of her team, and for all of the Pokemon that had access to a good move to take out the Claydol, this fight was pretty simple. With Mawile, Laren and Agron, Skarmory, Metang and Metagross, Registeel, and Jirachi making it through without any real problems. The two pressure points of this type were, expectedly, Aeron and Beldum both of whose limited movesets and defensive weaknesses made this fight near impossible. In Beldum's case, the only move it can learn is Takedown, meaning this was a non-starter from the very beginning, but Aeron did at least have Iron Tail and Swagger to give it a fighting chance. Unfortunately, with his speed and weakness to ground, Claydol's Earthquake became an insurmountable barrier, and we ended off round 1 steal with 2 losses and a total victory count of 148 out of 202. For our last type, we have to take a look at Normal which was overall pretty hit or miss. The majority of these Pokemon could learn Shadow Ball, and this became our frontline offensive strategy in most cases, earning us easy wins with Zigzagoon, Linoon, Vigoroth, Slacking, Loudred, Exploud, Spinda, Zangoose, Wigglytuff, Castform, and Kecleon. I also tried this strategy with Slackoth, Wismer, and even Igglypuff and Jigglypuff, but these Pokemon were so slow and weak that, despite my best efforts, each of them folded to Tate and Liza and got in line to try again in round 2. And don't even get me started on Azuril, whose even worse move pool and reliance on Sing had me praying for the 20 attempts to end by the time it got to its final loss. But there is still one more line that we have to look at here, Skitty and Delcaddy. You may be wondering why I kept them until the end, and that would be fair. Besides their cute design, nothing about them is particularly impressive, but there was something that made them special for this challenge. During my battles with Skitty in particular, I found myself turning to the move Helping Hand, which boosts the partner's attack power on the next move after using it, and this was exactly what I needed to push my second Skitty's Shadow Ball to the absolute limit and allow my kitty to burn through as much of Tate and Liza's team as possible before passing out and leaving its surviving partner to take the most important coin flip of its life, hit a sing, and carry us to an incredibly satisfying victory. With the normal type complete, we're now finished with round 1, having reached a total of 161 victories and 41 losses. This honestly isn't bad, but now it's time for us to see how well Tate and Liza can hold up against round 2. First off, I want to get the Pokemon for whom we weren't really able to alter the strategy at all out of the way. When it came to these Pokemon on the screen, even if I was able to alter the moveset slightly for round 2, there wasn't much I could do to prevent Tate and Liza from knocking them out before they were able to do anything, and we ended up with a round 2 loss for each of them. But aside from these duds, there were a number of Pokemon that were able to cinch a win in round 2 and earn us half a point to our total, so let's take a look at what happened. For CDOT, all it took was the addition of Swords Dance to boost up Shadow Ball's power for us to make it through the fight, while Oddish took advantage of Hidden Power Dark to have a catch-all super effective move that paired very well with Sleep Powder. With an extra use of Swagger in the addition of Hidden Power Dark to its move set, Torchic was able to overcome the Claydol quickly enough to secure a W, and Taylo used a combination of Guts, Swagger, Fly, and a Double Steel Wing to get the job done. The electric type in particular had great success with the unrestricted movesets, with each of Plusl, Minin, Voltorb, and Pichu utilizing their high special attack stats and the guaranteed super effective damage from Hidden Power Dark to destroy the Claydol before taking out the rest of their team, while in the bug type, Dustox, Ninkata, and Illumise each took advantage of the extra Shadow Ball TM to find their victories, although in Ninkata's case, it did still require a clutch Hail Mary Swagger at the end of the line. On Anorith, the addition of a Choice Band to boost its Metal Claw damage gave us just the edge we needed to eke out a win, and then finally came our little friends Ralts 1 and 2, 
who tapped into the darkness that lay within them and put an end to Tate and Liza's psionic reign of terror once and for all. And that's round 2 finished, but how did we do? In round 1, we managed to win with 161 Pokemon, while the 41 remaining were a loss. But out of those 41 Pokemon that didn't make the cut initially, once the rule set was unrestricted in round 2, we picked up an additional 13 victories which, at half a point each, brings our final score to 167.5 out of 202. And converting that, we end up with a Bruno Quotient of 83. For those of you who have been keeping up with the entire series, you'll know that this is a great score. Putting them on the board, Tate and Eliza easily come up as our most difficult trainers so far, with a BQ more than 10 points lower than our runner-up Claire. So I guess that answers our question. Tate and Eliza are actually pretty good. But I guess that's what happens when you're a psionically powered divided consciousness bent on overtaking the entire Pokemon world. <clears throat> well anyway, with the BQ settled, it's that time of the video where I ask you to help me decide who we face next in the BQ challenge. This time around, I'm going to put up the two options from our previous BQs who didn't make the cut, meaning we'll either be facing off against Champion Blue in Fire Red and Leaf Green, or Gym Leader Norman in Emerald. Be sure to leave a comment down below letting me know which you'd like to see more, and whichever gets the most votes will be the opponent we face next time. Oh, and if you choose blue, as always, please remember to let me know which team you think he should have. And with that, it's about time I get out of here. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. As always, if you noticed any weaknesses in the format, I would greatly appreciate it if you could outline those in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to make sure you're here for the next one. So thank you again, keep warm, and as always, stay phenomenal.